All right. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to our last book launch of this year. Today, we're presenting Barbara Kominska's Images of Miraculous Healing in the Early Modern Netherlands with Andrea Pearson as reference. The book is published by Brill in the series Studies on Art, Art History and Intellectual History. A wonderful series edited by Walter Mellion with other titles such as Monumental Sounds, Art and Listening Before Dante by Matthew Schulf, uh, Revolts and Political Violence in Early Modern Imagery by Malti Greece, and Art in Dispute, Catholic Debates at the Time of Trent by Vitsu de Boer. But today we focus on images of miraculous healing, which explores the ways in which paintings and prints of biblical miracles shaped viewers approaches to physical and sensory impairments and bolstered their belief in supernatural healing and charitable behavior. Let me introduce the author Barbara Kaminska to you. She is an assistant professor of art history at Sam Houston State University in Huntsville, Texas. She received her MA in art history from the University of Warsaw in 2007 and her PhD from the University of California, Santa Barbara in 2014. She has published extensively on interconfessional networks in the early modern Netherlands, Renaissance practices on hospitality, including functions of religious images in domestic spaces, and the iconography of charity in Netherlandish art. Barbara's current projects explore the intersection of Renaissance art theory and disability studies, with a particular focus on early modern painters with deafness. Barbara, thank you so much for being here. I'm really looking forward to hearing you on your new book. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me all right now. Um, so I just start with a brief visual description. I am a white uh, woman with medium long um, light blonde hair. I'm wearing a pink top and glasses in pink frames. And behind me is a brush wall with uh, a reproduction of Erasmus's portrait by Hans Holbein. And my pronouns are she, her. Um, so first of all, I would like to thank Stein uh, and Leiden University for giving me this opportunity to talk about my research. And I'm also really grateful to Andra for agreeing to be our respondent today. And thank you to all of you who made the time to join us today. So um, I would like to um, first talk a little bit about how this project started, um, then explain what it is and what it isn't meant to be, and what are some of the main arguments of the book. Um, then I would like to comment a little bit about um, the relationship between um, biblical stories of healing and healing um, miracles and disability in the early modern Netherlands. And finally close with some reflections on the legacy of the miraculous healing uh, tradition in popular culture, popular language um, and art history. So as Stein already mentioned, um, I grew up in Warsaw and that's also where I went to college. Um, and got my MA degree in art history. And one of the more famous paintings in the National Museum is Peter Artson's last painting, Seven Works of Mercy. And so this painting was always somewhere at the back of my head when I was writing my dissertation on religious imagery in 16th century Antwerp, which ended up being a project exclusively on Peter Bruchel the Elder. Um, but then a couple of years ago, um, I decided to return to, um, to the Seven Works of Mercy. And um, of course, this painting took me to other late paintings by Peter Artsen, um, the healing of the paralytic at the pool of Bethesda and Peter and John healing the sick. Um, and these three paintings are typically considered to be a part of one commission, probably for the masters of resident poor in Amsterdam. Um, and when I was doing my research, I very quickly discovered that in recent years, scholars um, have written wonderful books and essays on um, charity in the early modern Netherlands. So I had a lot to work with for the Warsaw Art Sun, but I also quickly realized that there is very little written about 
images of miraculous healing. And I had all these questions like who were the, who was the audience of those paintings? Where were they displayed? How does this paintings function um, in the period when, um, when those questions of miracles uh, were so heatedly debated and contested? Um, so I wanted to find answers to these questions, but um, I think this project also has grown out of more personal experiences and um, at, um, at the risk that, that they will sound unacademic, I would like to share them with you. So I lived most of my life in Poland and in the United States, and I have very often been struck by just how central religious rhetoric, Christian rhetoric specifically, um, is to socioeconomic and political discourses in both countries. And at the same time, um, I've also been struck very often by how unsympathetic, discriminatory, and openly hostile um, both societies are to persons with um, disabilities, to persons experiencing poverty, and how also both societies tend to create um, conditions um, that enable poverty among persons with disabilities. So um, I was really struck by this contrast, inconsistency, and I wanted to look at how historically this relationship between approaches to persons um, experiencing poverty and persons with disabilities um, has been shaped. So I hope that the origins of this book um, illuminate what it is and what it does not aspire to be. And I hope that the introduction in the book also accomplishes this goal. Um, it is meant to be a study of religious and social medical approaches to the biblical stories of uh, miraculous healing intersected with the attitudes towards persons with um, disabilities with impairments in the early modern Netherlands. It is also obviously meant to be a study of the miracle tradition and, and how the notion of miracle was changing at the time of religious reforms. And one of the things I realized early on was that um, there is certain um, taciturnity on the question of miracles in 16th century writings. And um, it seems to me that very often images, in fact, provide a much better opportunity at scriptural exegesis than writings at, um, at the time. So this is not primarily a book on disability. I am not suggesting applying the framework of miraculous healing to our um, thinking about present day um, disability. Um, but I wanted to look at why miraculous healing has become such a potent trope. Um, and even more importantly, um, how has it happened that um, charity has become so closely linked to um, miraculous um, healing before it began to be uh, framed negatively as a kind of conspicuous compassion? So what are some of the main arguments of, um, of this book? For early modern viewers, um, miraculous healing, as much as they wanted it um, was not was not a norm. Um, all denominations had a positive attitude to medicine to the extent that refusing medical help uh, was often considered suicide. Um, and what aids in this process is the separation of medical professionals identity from the trope of um, physician as Christ. And in fact, the first chapter of the book focuses on, on this trope of Christ the physician and physician um, as Christ. And that's what um, Hendrik Holtius is contesting in his series of four engravings, um, allegories on the medical profession, where ultimately the physician is praised uh, thanks to his arts, uh, thanks to his healing um, abilities that are um, derived from learning and, um, and science. And um, I'm afraid that actually this recognition that um, miraculous healing, hoping for a miracle, is not normative to Christianity um, is somewhat more relevant now, at least here in the US, where I think we probably by now all have this experience of 
um, talking to people who um, refuse who refuse to get vaccinated due to religious reasons, um, and um, I think we we need to keep in mind that this kind of thinking has never been mainstream in Christianity. It has always functioned somewhere at at the margins of um, of the plate. Um, so I mentioned that all denominations have this positive attitude towards. Um, medicine, but what distinguishes Protestantism from Roman Catholicism at the time is the development of the so-called doctrine of the cessation of miracles. And according to this doctrine, at some point um, in the early church during post-apostolic times, um, physical miracles ceased happening. And in the book, I propose that a very good visual example of this doctrine of cessation of miracles are paintings by Jos Drogslot, the Pool of Bethesda, and there are several similar renditions of this topic. So it's clearly something that was um, appealing to customers. Um, and in these paintings, the very idea that he miraculous healing could happen here and now is made absolutely ridiculous. Um, but it's also important to acknowledge that Drogslot is picking this particular story out of all the stories of miraculous healing because, um, well, at least I link it to the enormous popularity of the so-called healing wells across Europe, which was a phenomenon that the Reformation had real troubles um, with eliminating, and Dutch viewers are profoundly familiar with um, healing wells um, to which people pilgrimaged across Europe. Um, there is also one that starts producing water again in the 17th um, century. And those healing wells, when they are described, they are very, very often described along the lines of being a new Bethesda, um, or they are being compared to, um, to the Pool of Bethesda as described in the Bible. Now, the second main argument of this book is um, how for viewers in the 16th and 17th centuries, um, the way to imitate Christ's healing miracles was through charity, uh, which we can see in paintings such as Peter van Lins, The Healing of the Paralytic at the Pool of Bethesda, where in between Christ and the paralytic, we can see the personification of um, charity. Now, later on, um, this close association between healing miracles and um, compassion and charity um, has become problematic, but it's very clear that at that time for Christian viewers, um, mercy, compassion was the way to go. Um, and also that compassion and charity was meant to be expressed in very specific ways. Um, so by giving money to almshouses, to hospices, by providing for persons with um, disabilities. Um, and also the, um, the charity was um, understood in this context very often as medical care and in one of the chapters of my book I also look at what visiting the sick um, meant at the time and I really like this engraving after Martin the Foss in which we see a physician um, in the upper right corner um, examining a patient's um, urine uh, but we also see um, various other ways of helping um, the sick. And what I also really like about um, this engraving is how Christ is positioned at the end of the, of the world um, in a way that um, his figure and his head draws our attention to two scenes of almsgiving outside the hospice. Um, almsgiving to persons with um, mobility impairments. Now, typically those institutions would not admit persons with chronic disease and with um, disabilities. So here, are, here we are getting an important reminder that um, for them, almsgiving is really a inappropriate um, way to provide help. Um, all right, so, um, what about the intersection of, um, of those stories and persons with disabilities whom viewers would have met 
in everyday um, life. Um, just in terms of numbers, most of the images, well, most of the depictions of persons with disabilities at the time um, occur in the context of um, scenes of healing miracles from the Bible. So um, there's one suggestion that just visually this is the context for, uh, for viewing um, them in the period. But this does not necessarily mean that viewers would always approach uh, persons with disabilities with the same kind of um, compassion. And we have images such as um, this um, anonymous engraving published by, um, by Hieronymus Koch um, in the around 1560, in which we have a depiction of several persons with um, primarily mobility impairments. And the verses at the bottom of the print um, tell us all who would gladly live by the blue beggar's side go mostly as cripples, which expresses an extremely common sentiment in the period, according to which uh, persons with uh, mobility impairments were feigning their disability. And on the one hand, um, this um, this belief goes back to the Middle Ages when um, giving alms to persons who were fraudulent beggars um, was not considered a good deed, so it would not contribute to a person's salvation. Um, but it's also it can also be attributed to the increasing fear that um, persons who are lazy. Um, who are feigning disabilities um, to, um, to be provided for um, constitute a, a threat to the social um, order. Now, when it comes to sensory impairments, there is a lot of prejudice against um, people um, with hearing or, um, um, or ocular um, impairments here because of this strong period connection between seeing and faith and between hearing and faith, um, more so in the Protestant um, tradition. And um, especially in prints, we see um, often an attempt at exegetical analysis of what actually is um, the relationship between senses and faith. And what does it mean that um, in an image such as this engraving by Anton Virix, we see the man born blind praying already before he met Christ. Um, and I really, this was actually one of my favorite images um, that I came across when working on this project um, because of the way um, that Christ is shown uh, when he is um, bending down and he looks exactly as he's portrayed typically in images of Christ and the adulterous woman when um, uh, when he writes on the ground and um, he that is without sin among you let him first cast a stone at her because here we see the same kind of representation in the context of a story um, in which apostles ask Christ um, who has sinned this man or his parents and Christ responds that neither he nor his parents um, so this is a very important image to kind of um, question this commonplace association um, between sin and disease and sin and um, disability. Um, there are some images which seem to suggest more explicitly that persons with disabilities were um, seen along the lines or as uh, parallel to the persons described in the Bible, um, such as Lucas Hassel's landscapes. Um, again, um, this is another example that um, I really enjoyed working with, Christ healing the deaf mute man. Um, he, images of this particular miracle are, actu are actually very, very rare in the um, Netherlands. But here we are um, getting this very interesting composition where the healing of the deaf mute man is happening in the background and in the foreground we have a man with a mobility impairment looking hopefully at that scene in, um, in the background which also correlates with a kind of relative 
impact of um, hearing and mobility impairments um, in the Netherlands on um, a person's life, uh, with mobility impairments being um, much more um, challenging to to navigate in that um, in that society. Um, what I think is also helpful when we try to determine functions of those images is where they were is the question where they were displayed, and um, it's very common for us I think to assume that they were made for and um, displayed in hospitals or charity institutions, um, except that um, that's not what inventories tell us. And given that few inventories of um, charity institutions bother with images, um, sculptures at all. But from the evidence that we have, it seems like places like, uh, for instance, the oldest hospital in Antwerp, um, St. Elizabeth's Hospital, um, had an image of St. Elizabeth of Hungary, um, images of some other um, saints who, who dedicated their lives um, to the care of the sick. Um, we often have like standard repertoire, Last Supper, things like that. We sometimes have images of the Seven Walks of Mercy, and that's a painting made for um, a Haskos of Barbara and Florence in Utrecht. But I have not come across a single case where an image of a healing miracle would have been displayed in, um, in an almshouse or in a, um, in a hospice. Um, they were all in private collections. So, um, oh, and I just wanted to point out here that it's remarkable how different Trochslots paints his persons with disabilities in the Pool of Bethesda paintings versus what he did in the in the Seven Walks of Mercy. It's a completely different crowd, which again, to some extent, indicates um, that um, charity is a proper way of responding to those miracles. And um, on that note, I will um, now briefly comment on um, what do these images mean uh, mean to us and what its legacy means to art history. So I mentioned earlier that uh, miraculous healing was not a norm, was not um, a normative way of thinking about health and disease um, and disability at the time. Um, of course, there have always been um, itinerant healers who were trying to sell people miraculous um, cures. So there was always obviously um, a hunger for that kind of, um, of services. Um, and I think that the like, overall social cultural investment in those narratives of miraculous um, healing explains why this narrative has been so prevalent throughout the um, the ages and um, despite the efforts of disability scholars um, persons with disabilities nowadays would often share the experience of hearing comments on a daily basis about how god will heal them or something along the lines of i will pray for you um, and also um, there is this tendency um, to refer to uh, medical progress and different prosthetics as uh, miraculous. Um, and what I've noticed is that very often in our thinking about, for instance, 19th and 20th century disability and disability studies, um, we kind of tend to dismiss um, these labels of like miraculous um, prosthetics, um, AIDS, and so on and so forth as a kind of figure of speech. Well, I think it's actually um, important to acknowledge that those narratives of miraculous healing had a very profound effect on, um, on person's um, lives. And um, what corresponds with this is the idea that both persons um, receiving miracles and receiving charity um, had to be worthy of them. And that's what we see in paintings such as Art Since the Healing of the Paralytic at the Pool of Bethesda, where we see this like very orderly, compassionate crowd. So um, in the 16th and 17th centuries, there is this expectation that you will receive charity if, um, if you deserve it, if you are worthy um, of, um, 
of it. Um, so that's, that was one of my goals of this detailed examination of the relationship between charity and miraculous um, healing. Um, so I think that when we use this kind of labels that something is like a miraculous treatment or referring along those lines to persons with disabilities, uh, we need to keep in mind what, what kind of power these narratives had for people over the, um, the ages. And just to close with um, some of the imagery that bridges genre imagery and biblical parables, such as the parable of the blind, um, what we, are, what we um, realize looking at, um, at this image is the profound disconnect um, between the lives of persons depicted here and the lives of the owner or the owners of, um, of this painting because um, only a non-disabled fully sighted viewer was privileged to really scrutinize these different ophthalmological impairments. And um, this is even more um, profound um, of an effect in the case of Bruegel's um, cripples, where an early owner of this painting added this note on the back, here nature transformed in painted images and seen in her cripples is amazed to see that Bruegel is her peer, where the interest clearly lies in the discourse of um, on imitation um, rather than the subject matter of um, of the painting. So I think that um, these examples alert us to how connoisseurship, um, the history of collecting, our discipline itself um, has been very much founded upon this like able-bodied um, paradigm, which I believe is a legacy worth um, confronting as we strive to make our discipline more accessible and um, more inclusive. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, Barbara, that is a very nice introduction to a very, very nice uh, book. Indeed, you ended already with the actuality of, of how indeed we can bring art history far more to an interest of inclusion. You also made it very actual by referring to that uh, task not to refuse medical care. Uh, and what is absolutely fascinating is how miracles and charity are, are all of a sudden uh, combined in very uh, complex uh, ways. So thank you very much for making this clear. Now I give the floor to Andrea Pearson, but let me first introduce you. She is a professor of art history at American University in Washington, DC. She specializes in the study of gender, sex, and the history of the body. In, cultural, in visual culture of late medieval and early modern Northern Europe. She's the author of Gardens of Love and the Limits of Morality in Early Netherlandish Art, Brill 2019, and Envisioning Gender in Burgundian Devotional Art, Experience Authority Resistance, Ashgate 2005. Her essays have appeared in journals such as Art History, Jesta, the Journal of Historians of Netherlandish Art and Renaissance Quarterly. She is the editor of Women and Portraits in Early Modern Europe, Gender Agency and Identity, Ashgate 2008, and co-editor of the book series Illuminating Women Artists, Renaissance and Baroque, published by the Getty and Lund Humphreys. Andrea, thank you so much for being here. The floor is yours, but I'll first put on your PowerPoint. And that one is over here. There you go. There we are. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Very Good. We had a little trouble earlier, so I just wanted to confirm. Excellent. Uh, so many thanks to Stein for kindly inviting me to speak today and to Barbara for producing a fascinating volume. It's truly an honor to be here to offer a few words in response. After a brief introduction, which includes setting the study's re, uh, revision of the semantics of disability into a broader context, I will propose some complementary ways of thinking about pre-modern disability and the applicability of certain methods to its study as a basis for discussion and possible directions for the future. In framing for us today what her book is and is not, 
Barbara positioned her contribution at the nexus of early modern art history, disability studies, and biblical studies, specifically the Christological miracles of scripture and their advancement of charity and imagery. These fields have intersected only rarely in the scholarship and never in a book length study with a critical framework like hers. This is in part because many of the works that depict miraculous healing were made by artists who are lesser known in the discipline of art history. Exceptions, of course, come to mind, as with the example on the screen, and because the field of early modern disability studies is relatively new. Barbara's exploration of these points of contact is therefore a milestone in the scholarship. Barbara's book can be placed among a growing number of new studies that revise the terms, the lexicons of a specific debate with sensitivity to the limits and challenges of those terms in history and in scholarship. New glossaries are emerging and these resources expose ways that terminology can elide, disparage and perpetuate bias against certain populations. I'm thinking here of two works that are useful for teaching and scholarship. One of these is P. Gabriel Foreman's Slavery Glossary of 2018, which revised familiar terms to illuminate their limitations and their biases. Foreman chose to use the term enslaved as an adjective rather than slave as a noun to quote, disaggregate the condition of being enslaved with the status of being a slave. People weren't slaves, they were enslaved, unquote. Similarly, Foreman adopted the term enslaver rather than master because, quote, master transmits the aspirations and values of the enslaving class without naming the practices they engaged, unquote. Just as useful as Foreman's work is a new detailed lexicon, 34 pages in length, by Alicia Spencer Hall and Blake Gutt that appears in their edited volume called Trans and Gender Queer Subjects in Medieval Hagiography. This book, published in June by Amsterdam University Press, offers ways of thinking about trans and queer issues through the literary genre of saints' lives, where authors experimented with boundaries of sex and gender. For her part, Barbara reevaluated the pre-modern terminology of infirmity and the contemporary terms by which it is addressed to offer useful ways to contend with problemat problematic semantics. For example, some earlier studies distinguished between impairment and disability, where impairment signaled a medical or bodily condition perceived as non-normative, and disability referred to the social constructs around those conditions, such as the dependency on able-bodied, uh, on the able-bodied for basic necessities and care. However, as Barbara rightly pointed out, the lines between impairment and disability were not clear in practical application in early modernity. Her example is leprosy, which in scripture described a number of different skin afflictions, quote, all of which connoted impurity and all of which led to social exclusion. Medically speaking, leprosy as an impairment was in flux, but its social construct, leprosy as a disability that requires exclusion has remained the same, unquote. In the end, uh, Barbara elected to retain historical terms that many modern readers will find offensive, among them cripple, lame, paralytic, and blind. She explained that these terms have equivalence in early modern biblical translations and other writings of the period, and thus they are historically accurate. Furthermore, retaining them lays bare the, quote, oppressive power of, of the language and the historical reality, unquote, in the words of Thomas Stainton uh, that Barbara quoted in her book. I appreciate these and other decisions about language precisely because they expose rather than elide bias. Another strength of the book is its sensitivity to the potential audiences of the works under study. Barbara's evidence sometimes led her to offer conclusions that defied expectation. 
On the one hand, it was not unexpected to read that images of miraculous healing, which were neither evidently liturgical nor devotional, although these are more fluid categories than I think we sometimes recognize, uh, were not displayed in churches. On the other hand, it was surprising to read that neither were they displayed in almshouses or institutions of healing, as was the case with Matthias Grunewald's familiar Isenheim altarpiece. And Barbara mentioned this um, in her presentation a few minutes ago. Rather, inventories reveal the presence of, of such images primarily in domestic settings, specifically in the reception and dining rooms of the burger class. There, as Barbara convincingly argued, the works modeled and encouraged a charitable behavior toward the infirm among viewers in the familiar topos of the Imitatio Christi. However, the production of certain other works of the disabled and their miraculous healing in the form of prints or in um, uh, images in printed books enlarged the potential viewership, since through presumed circulation, prints were more widely available than most of the paintings illustrated in the volume. And here's just an example of each type, um, on uh, each media type on the screen. This leads me to wonder if and under what condition these works could have been accessible to the disabled, and what disabled people experiencing these works for, from a variety of subject positions would have thought of them. For example, if the responses changed over time in cases in which their physical conditions changed. One aspect of this query is that those with visual impairments would not have experienced images and certain material objects in uh, uh, the same way as those with sharp uh, vision or uh, they is possibly would not experience them at all, depending upon their, uh, their condition, uh, their ocular um, infirmity. Uh, furthermore, it may seem logical to conclude that these images would not have reached the infirm since imagery often suggests that poverty and disability were closely connected in this era. Indigent, 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 um, uh, not having access to uh, financial resources <laughs> did not lend itself to image access. Uh, with the exception of works like the Isenheim altarpiece, which were displayed in hospital settings. Uh, yet research is revealing that some pre-modern people with physical ailments of the types illustrated here were economically privileged and did have access an issue to, well, to which I will return. The relationship between disability and poverty and the potential for varied responses to imagery contingent on those issues points to new work on situational intersectionality, which Barbara's book helps to advance. This approach arose in the 1980s from the dissatisfaction of uh, women of color with the exclusionary practices of white space feminism, which they found inadequate in addressing issues of race. Intersectionality as currently practiced understands identity as culturally constructed, pluralistic, variously overlaid and potentially in flux. Identities both assign power and operate within complex power relations that can oscillate in their consequences to individuals and groups. As political scientist Anne Runyon put it, quote, intersectional theory is now applied to understanding how we all carry multiple, albeit constructed and provisional identities. The salience of such identities based not only on race, normative gender, class, and nation, but also on sexuality, non-normative gender, physical disability, religion, and age varies in different times and contexts, conferring either disadvantages or privileges on each of us, again, in relation to time and context, unquote. For historians of early Netherlandish art, intersectionality complicates social encodings by implicating multi multiple fluctuating identity categories that might be sustaining, conflicting, or somewhere in between. Artists, patrons, and works of art could, and usually did, validate the able-bodied subject positions from which most early modern Europeans in spaces of influence or power operated, the very individuals who produced, commissioned, purchased, and viewed art, at least in the current narrative. <clears throat> 
These images on the screen ostensibly reinforce such beliefs for some of these privileged viewers. The discipline needs much more work to be done to better understand intersectionality in early modernity as it relates to disability and caregiving. For example, as a specialist in the study of gender, I was intrigued by Barbara's point that images of miraculous healing may have advanced new attitudes about gendered care in the late 16th century that began to exclude women from the medical profession except for afflictions pertaining only to women. This engraving of Christ surrounded by vignettes of these seven works of mercy may reflect and help to advance the masculinization of the healing arts through the representation of a muscular, powerful male physique dominant in a composition about caregiving. We might also benefit from revisiting previously identified gender resonances in imagery, such as this illumination of Duchess Margaret of York undertaking the seven works of mercy as the newly married foreign bride of the Burgundian Duke Charles the Bold. This miniature comes from two didactic manuscripts Margaret commissioned by uh, Margaret commissioned shortly after her marriage in 1468 when she was seeking advice about how to best fulfill her obligations as a bride and duchess. One of the volumes attends to the Vita Activa and the other to the Vita Contemplativa. The image from the volume on the Vita Activa represents Margaret dutifully enacting the works of mercy while Christ, uh, while Christ looks on. Earlier, I wrote of the miniature that Christ is not simply present with Margaret, but provides a kind of archetype of sorts for her act of charity. Christ is an authoritative and persuasive tutor to Margaret. However, in Catrick and Barber's book, this painting of the Last Judgment with the Seven Works of Mercy and the Seven Deadly Sins, commissioned by the Antwerp Chamber of Almoners a few decades later, I'm thinking of the image of Margaret somewhat differently. In the painting, Christ appears in each scene of charity nearest to the persons who perform these acts as if encouraging their imitatio Christi. And I know this is hard to see and I apologize for that. In the illumination, however, Christ is usually grouped with those whom Margaret tends. In this detail, she visits the imprisoned while he appears behind bars with the incarcerated. Here, Christ is not simply an influencer, but the grouping of his figure with the unfortunate rather than the charitable implies, implies that as Margaret administers to the less fortunate, she also administers to him. This approach aligns with Matthew 29, verse 39, quote, as long as you uh, did uh, did it to one of these, my least brethren, you did it to me, unquote. This arrangement represents a quite different vision of charity than uh, that espoused by the painting uh, that I showed a minute ago, for it drove home that Christ is like the subjects to whom Margaret administers. In fact, in George Pence's Visiting the Sick from 1534, uh, which Barbara illustrated in her book, Christ is the patient administered to by the faithful. In Margaret's case, such a charity benefited not only her soul and chance for salvation, but also the reputation of the Burgundian rulers, most importantly, her husband Charles. The illumination developed with the aim of offering Margaret instruction uh, as a new uh, bride and Duchess encouraged Margaret's participation in an economy of socio-political salvation uh, that was personally rewarding and politically advantageous. Uh, I'm going to show this only for a brief second, but um, it comes from uh, this chart comes from a book that uh, you see cited on uh, the screen. Uh, it, uh, uh, the image might also have associated Margaret with aspects of female holiness and spiritual authority in the sense that, as Donald Weinstein and Rudolf Bell demonstrated, quote, women appear in disproportionately high numbers among the great healer and helper saints, unquote. 
an investigation of the image of Margaret, uh, Margaret of York within a gendered courtly context would be with a fuller workup, an example of microanalysis in which specific historical cases are examined in fine detail. I'll walk through another example of this approach with the work on the screen shortly. First, some background to argue that disability studies is well served by microanalysis since it can reveal obscured evidence about issues in which art historians are invested, from the social conditions in which people operated to the richness and variety of cultural production, to strategies of image making, displaying, and viewing. Importantly, it also demonstrates anomalies, which instructively enrich contemporary understanding of historical situations and it challenges the conclusion of broadly conceived projects that often elide understudied populations. Even now, surveys tend to omit the very people and issues with which identity studies are dedicated, thereby embedding the ex exclusionary master narrative into deeper consciousness despite opportunities for change. In art history, the narrative also has been driven by issues of quality, which can mean that images depicting the infirm are deprioritized, a point made by Barbara. Furthermore, inclusivity is well served by visuality, an approach that accounts for possibilities of interpretation that arise from experience-based looking and seeing, such that individual viewers might make meaning of images differently. Early modern viewers navigated imagery with various resources at their disposal by exercising a kind of interior agency and in making meaning of the visual cues they encountered. Individualized experiences, skills, and strategies allowed for readings that differed from and probably sometimes countered those that artists intended, cases of which are themselves largely circumstantial for early modernity. As more close work of this kind is produced, work that attends to disability and other understudied categories of human conditions, digital tools will visualize heretofore unrecognized historical connections and patterns that will advance our historical understanding. Such tools can also visualize change over time when backed by the conclusions of focus studies upon which broader claims could convincingly rest. I'll close with some brief comments about the work on the screen with an analysis that bears upon the approaches I've discussed. Most of you listening probably know that this work is an example of what historians of early ne Netherlandish art have termed a Schlottenhofia or enclosed garden, as in the Song of Songs of the Hebrew Bible. This work consists of an upright cabinet filled with handmade garden elements and sculptures of St. Elizabeth of Hungary, Ursula, and Catherine of Alexandria. Portrait wings are attached to the sides. I draw here from my microanalysis of this Hofia, which was published in JHNA in 2017, with a slightly revised version in my book called Gardens of Love, published by Brill that um, uh, Stein mentioned earlier, which charted moralized approaches to bodily conditions, desires, and behaviors through early Netherlandish art. In the article and chapter, I argued that the closed eyes of the kneeling figure to the far right, uh, in the far right portrait wing, a very unusual feature for a portrait, signaled visual impairment. And here you can see more closely that figure uh, with her eyes closed. Historian Wim Huskin in Mechelen, where the Hoffi was made, first suggested this possibility to me. And in following up, I came to understand that shut eyes were a medieval and early modern convention for sightlessness as the, in the two examples on the screen. Archival and visual evidence led me to identify the close-eyed woman as Maria van de Putte, a professed sister at an Augustinian convent in Mechelen that cared for people with infirmities, and the other two kneeling figures as her parents, Jacob van de Putte and Margaret Spaas, and they're pictured with their patron saints. This is, in other words, a family triptych, like so many others produced in the Low Countries in this period. I concluded that Jakob and Margareta commissioned the Hofje to mediate positively with the community on behalf of themselves and their disabled daughter 
whose blindness rendered all three spiritually suspect. In so doing, they laid claim in the hospital context to charitable and pious practices that uh, merited Maria's acceptance as a professed nun, as well as her and her parents' salvation. For Maria in particular, the Hofje claimed devotional understanding not through the privileged sense of sight, despite the garden's visual pull, but rather by multi multi-sensory devotion and the possibilities for healing implied by the Hofje's sacred content including high value relics that this wealthy family could afford to acquire. So here we're talking about a type of privilege that not all infirm people enjoyed. And in fact, most did not. Furthermore, through the lens of visuality and intersectionality, the Hofier reminded the hospital sisters of their commitment to Maria, whose presence carried an expectation of lifelong care that was, an, uh, that was in addition to their supervision of an already demanding public infirmary. Jakob and Margareta may also have had reason to worry about the quality of their care since the hospital had a history of resisting reforms that required the sisters to renew their commitment to the infirm. Yet accepting Maria as a professed sister benefited the community for it embedded the sisters more securely into a spiritual economy considered advantageous to the, bod uh, to the bodily abled and disabled alike. Now though, I want to add one more point about the nature of visuality. It is by definition exclusionary of those with visual impairments. However, material objects like the garden represented here circumvented visual experiences uh, with a multi-sensory aesthetic that invites a multi-sensory engagement. I do not suggest doing away with visuality by any means because it's a crucial way to understand individual experience and has so much to offer. Yet thinking beyond it to sensory engagement more broadly, as some scholarship has uh, done, mostly without a focus on disability, may lead to deeper and more meaningful understandings of the intersections of art and material history and disability studies. Many more close investigations and new ways of thinking will be necessary before we arrive at a truly inclus inclusive historical narrative. Methods such as microhistory, visuality and sensory experience, intersectionality, and other approaches we can't yet imagine will help lead us there. I end with a closing thank you to Barbara and Stein, and many thanks to those of you listening as well. Thank you very, very much, Andrea, uh, for this, 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 on the one hand, wonderful introduction to the book, your reflection on that, and on the other hand, of course, by, by looking at future perspectives and bringing in some other fascinating uh, case studies. So, so thank you very, very much both of you for two uh, very nice and interesting presentations uh, you can put all questions in the chat for everyone who has a question and there's already one question by Larry Silver a very nice one thank you very much Larry for this question I just read it aloud uh, the tone of Bruegel and Cox 16th century images of the disabled pejorative for the most part is also continued in Van de Venice Grisaeus in the 17th century could you comment on this uncharitable view of the disabled and the likely audience for these for those works? Yeah, thank you. That's uh, an excellent question. So what we see in the 1600s is actually a culmination of this process of um, approaching persons with disabilities with suspicion. Um, there is a fascinating pamphlet published in Amsterdam in the early um, 17th century about miracles that occurred and occurred daily in the correction house. Um, that was the first correction house established in Europe. And the pamphlet is essentially modeled after those, um, after, um, those uh, miracles described that are happening uh, at Scherpenhuvel, at Halle, and at other pilgrimage destinations. Um, and the pamphlet, the pamphlet essentially describes about how there are these young men who are cured of um, the conditions of um, sloth, laziness, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, by the by the by saint work or saint labor. So this idea that um, they try to avoid working because of laziness is definitely more pronounced in the 17th century. Um, 
there is also a sentiment now that even if a person has an impairment, this does not exempt them from work. And already Juan Luis Vives does it um, in the 1527 in On Assistance to the Poor, where he lists various kinds of um, uh, occupations that uh, persons with different disabilities um, could um, could have. Of course, it's it's hard to tell how applicable and how it, it, it was in in practice. I actually think that, um, especially when it comes to friends that um, have this negative, uncharitable depiction of persons with disabilities in the 17th, 17th century, I think they, they were supposed to be broadly circulated and um, we can similarly uh, like that um, engraving by um, published by by Koch, which was rather um, cheaply and quickly done in comparison to some of its visual um, sources. So I would I would think that there was this idea of circulating um, broadly the belief um, in um, in persons, especially feigning their impairments. Um, as, um, as a kind of threat to social order. It's actually also really interesting that there was this idea that uh, many persons are feigning. Uh, well, in fact, modern physicians were able to um, recognize very specifically what um, this visual language we see there, uh, what kind of authentic impairment it, it actually um, depicts. All right, thank you very much. Another question, I'm intrigued by uh, Andrea's discussion of intersectionality. How do you both envisage the future of early modern art culture in relation to William uh, uh, Crenshaw's term? Should I start, Barbara? Do you want to comment on that first? No, go ahead, please. Okay, all right, okay. Uh, so um, thank you for the question. And I have to say that um, I feel like we're at such a crossroads right now in terms of um, uh, different methods that are coming together in ways that really open up possibilities for the future. Um, it's almost as though to me that the, the uh, possibilities are endless. And, um, and I think we're really on the cusp of being able to take uh, concerns and um, uh, uh, issues around intersectionality, combining them with some of the other methods that I mentioned. And it's hard to know where it will go in the future, but I think there'll be a much um, a greater view of, of topics that are worth investigation and um, that are um, oh, that rise to the surface in the academic world as uh, worthy of some of the subjects that have been part of this of the discourse for a long time. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know we're we're at a point um, where we are thinking not only about how we want to work around intersectionality but also how it impacts uh, the way in which people move through the academy and, and their career tra trajectories and, um, and mm, the ways in which uh, topics, certain topics that have been subject for discussion uh, have been um, have been sidelined uh, in certain ways. And I think of this in, uh, about gender studies in a way, which I've <laughs> worked on my entire life uh, and, um, you know, sort of seems to come and go in its importance. But I think we're at a point now where we start to understand that those sorts of methods really need to be uh, elevated in academia and um, uh, given the same kind of attention that traditional approaches like iconography, for example, um, has, um, has received in the academy. All right. I, I hope that's what you're getting at, but I'd be happy to take a follow-up question. <laughs> Barbara? Well, I think Andrea described it really, um, really well, what I'm hoping that um, Apples would also help advance is early modern um, disability um, yes. studies um, because um, I think up until very recently um, a lot of studies have been starting with 
um, the Enlightenment. So it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's even more about like that philosophical and cultural moment um, and what it meant for, for persons with disabilities, even more so than um, in terms of chronologically, um, right. strictly, strictly speaking. Uh, but I also love, Andrea, your point about um, how we really need to think about those issues as not only um, scholarship endeavor, but also what kind of consequences um, mm -hmm. does it have uh, for persons mm -hmm. navigating um, academia and, um, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Then I can conclude with my question. It, it was actually by hearing uh, Andrea that, that I had some questions for you. Uh, uh, Barbara, a question which is twofold, actually. Are there, uh, in the 17th century depictions of the charitability or the miracles of Christ, are there recognizable persons there? Are there people mm -hmm. who could be the, the patron as such? And then a follow-up mm -hmm. question about that. Uh, the architecture is so different in, in many of those, those paintings. It has that a reason. Does it refer to a specific city, specific place? <laughs> Yeah, so I I have not. This is a fascinating question. I have not come across not um, a clear example in which um, such a painting would have been made for a specific um, pattern. I think it's a. I think your question actually poses a very interesting question about um, whether persons with disabilities would have seen themselves in those paintings because mm -hmm. they were typically um nude seen by um by patrons um and i would like to maybe think um but you know this is really a conjecture um that perhaps to some extent and it was like it's nowadays where you know every person's experience is different and there are persons with disabilities who are very outspoken about how they can't imagine what it would mean for them to be healed mm -hmm. um, while other persons would would like to experience um that now in terms of architecture that's really something i was struck by while looking at those images mm -hmm. in the book i correlate um some of those paintings with some passages from john yes. calvin um where he talks about um how um how Christ's miracles or how Christ's presence is greater than any kind of worldly ornament. Um, and yet there is this curiosity about um, what kind of perspectival experiences um, do those paintings um, offer, especially with the paintings of, of the of, um, of Bethesda. But um, I, will, I will keep thinking about it because that's a very important mm -hmm. question. Thank you. All right, that's mm -hmm. a very good note to end. Thank you, both of you. Also, <laughs> thanks to Larry for his kind words uh, in the chat. <laughs> and of course, thanks to Barbara and Andrea for uh, fascinating, fascinating lectures and a very nice discussion afterwards. This was the last book launch, but I'm really happy with ending with this uh, very uh, energetic and really inspiring uh, talks. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone, for being here. And I uh, hope to see you uh, next year. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.